Hey folks, Darren Moore here. Tonight I'm going to read for you uh, one of what I consider to be one of the most amazing encapsulations and introductions to a book I have ever read. Uh, and it's to one of my favorite books, Irving Babbitt's Rousseau and Romanticism. There are uh, a lot of books in my library that frankly are right at my intellectual capacity. <laughs> this is one of them. Uh, in fact, um, the person whose introduction I'll be reading tonight, uh, and I hope I'm saying his name right, Klis Rhein, also wrote a book that is frankly over my head <laughs> called Will, Imagination, and Reason. I'm, I've tried to pick this up a couple times. Um, it, the subtitle is Babbitt, Croce, and the Problem of Reality. And the reality is I just don't have the, the brain power to be able to fully understand this book. However, when I read Romanticism, Rousseau and Romanticism, uh, as with all of Irving Babbitt's books, whether it be Democracy and Leadership, uh, A Character and Culture, he also wrote 1908, uh, The Literature in American College. Uh, Irving Babbitt is a man who uh, was able to speak to me in a way that, frankly, um, appealed to my intellect, but also uh, showed really what I thought, uh, particularly in this book, Rousseau and Romanticism, uh, what is the, the lingering legacy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It was several generations ago that the ideas of Irving Babbitt, who lived from 1865 to 1933, first excited controversy. They would move virtually every leading American intellectual and literary figure of his time to comment. Babbitt's challenge to dominant currents and ethics, aesthetics, and philosophy brought down upon him a flood of criticism. Among the more unfriendly critics were Edmund Wilson, Oscar Cargill, Sinclair Lewis, and Ernest Hemingway. The irritability and sheer vehemence of many of Babbitt's detractors indicated that, even as they tried to dismiss the unorthodox Harvard professor, they perceived him as a threat to their hegemony as arbiters of culture and moral sensibility. The extent of Babbitt's violation of the moral, intellectual, and aesthetic spirit of the times and the prominence and the number of his enemies limited his influence. Reckless distortions of his ideas gained wide currency. Despite the continuation and the strengthening of the trends that Babbitt resisted, and despite the dangers long attendant upon favorably mentioning his name, his ideas proved resilient. He was never without allies or supporters. In the 1920s and up to his death, Babbitt found himself the recognized leader of an entire intellectual and cultural movement called New Humanism or American Humanism. Although his ideas never found favor with more than an, econ an econ academic minority, excuse me, he won the high, if sometimes qualified, admiration of many writers who attained considerable stature in the United States and abroad. Besides his close intellectual ally and friend, Paul Elmer Moore, these individuals include T.S. Eliot, uh, Vernier Jaeger, Russell Kirk, Walter Lippmann, Louis Mercier, Nathan Pusey, v Peter Weirich, and Austin Warren. In addition, the writing of some of the well-known figures who seemed to be chiefly critics of Babbitt came to show the unmistakable signs of his influence. Arthur Lovejoy and his view of Romanticism is but one example. Rene Wellick, though long careful to dis distance himself from Babbitt, speaks of Babbitt's, quote, real, critic or po real critical power and acumen. In 1960, Harvard University inaugurated the Irving Babbitt Chair of Compar Comparative Literature. New editions of Babbitt's books over the years and a large and growing secondary liter excuse me, literature testify to the continuing relevance and fascination of his ideas. In the last couple of decades, there have been a notable surge of scholarship in Babbitt, as well as on Paul Elmer Moore, some of which has given greater philosophical stringency and depth to the discussions of their larger significance. In 1983, a two-day scholarship conference on Babbitt's work held at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. commemorated the 50th anniversary of Babbitt's death. A related collective volume, Irving Babbitt in Our Time, explicates and reassesses Babbitt's work. In 1984, the National Humanities Institute, NHI, was founded in Washington, D.C. Among its aims is to promote the study and application of Babbitt's ideas. One of NHI's earliest publications was a new edition of Babbitt's first book, Literature and the American College, uh, which came out in 1908. There are a large number, there are a large number of recent studies of varying size and emphasis that either concentrate on Babbitt's life 
and work or relate his ideas to different fields. By the end of the 20th century, it is increasingly evident that although Babbitt's work still needs to be more fully and widely understood, it represents one of the enduring achievements of American intellectual culture. His wide-ranging writing represents an impressive exploration of the basis of civilization and of the central dynamics of the life and letters of modern Western society. His assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of modernity is remarkable for its perspicacity and its prescience. Long ago, Babbitt diagnosed, diagnosed and proposed treatment for the maladies within modern America and Western society that are now widely bemoaned. Because of the score and originality of Babbitt's mind, excuse me, because of the scope and the originality of Babbitt's mind, he did not fit neatly into conventional intellectual categories. Babbitt, Babbitt criticized the dominant form of modern moral and aesthetic sensibility, sentimental humanitarianism, in the tradition of Jean-Jacques Rousseau as a dangerous and decadent perversion of Christian ethics. But he was also reluctant to embrace traditional religious dogmas, though his notion of ethical self-discipline had much in common with the historical Christianity, including American Protestant, Protestantism, he did not identify the, the source of moral order with a personal God. He added to the unease of many Christians by writing admirably, admirably, admiringly about Buddhism. Babbitt took a strong exception to the reigning aesthetic orthodoxy of la pour la, or art for art's sake, calling for classical standards and ethical aesthetic discrimination, but he did not on account favor a return to a mimetic aesthetic. He empath empathetically rejected didactism in art. Babbitt could find no justification for the application of natural science concepts and methods to the humanities and social sciences, but neither did he believe that the study of religion, ethics, art, and society should be based upon metaphysical spe speculation. In the modern world, a new attention to the experiential evidence was necessary. Although Babbitt drew heavily on classical and Christian sources, he saw a need to revise and develop old Western traditions with reference to the best in modernity. Uh, life and Times. Let me see if I can bridge this little section. Uh, maybe I'll do the whole thing afterwards. But Irving Babbitt was born in Dayton, Ohio on August 2nd, 1865. He was descended uh, on his father's side from an Englishman who had settled in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1643. His great-grandfather, a Harvard graduate, and his grandfather, a graduate of Yale Divinity School, were con Congregationalist ministers who revisited evangelical anti-intellectualism and disdain for higher culture. Irving's father, Edwin, abandoned the stern doctrines of his forebears for an optimistic and ethereal spiritualism. He was a businessman, physician, and educator of crankish leanings who authored books on such subjects as life forces, <laughs> magnetism, and social amelioration. His pseudoscientific schemes and sentimentalism would be, for Irving Babbitt, egregious examples of larger tendencies that he regarded as eroding traditional Western civilization. So Irving was a, Irving was a rebel. Uh, let, me, let me skip to the real crux of this here. Um, Babbitt's life is interesting, um, but he was just simply a awesome Harvard professor. So let me skip to uh, uh, the, the real heart of the matter here. Babbitt, Rousseau, and Romanticism. Rousseau and Romanticism may be Babbitt's best known and most widely discussed book. It is perhaps also the one that best conveys the ethical, aesthetical core of his thought. <laughs> Excuse me, that's my cat Dutch wanting to go out. Brutus will probably let himself in and out as we, as we go through this tonight, too. Like Babbitt's other books, it is broad in scope. It examines a variety of literary and other manifestations of Romanticism and presents a typology of the imaginative inclinations of that movement. These phenomena are compared to earlier notions of art and life, and especially to classical and neoclassical principles. For Babbitt's works of imagination are integral to and even constitutive, constitutive of human life in general. 
And uh, let me just give you that line again. For, <laughs> for Babbitt, works of imagination are integral to and even constitutive of human life in general. And he explores romanticism with a view to its implications for Western civilization. Babbitt is particularly interested in its ethical significance, which he finds both far-reaching and disturbing. Rousseau and Romanticism is indistinguishably, indistinguishably a work of literary history and criticism and a work of philo philosophy of civilization. It deals with the ethics and theory of knowledge as well as aesthetics. It has been pointed out often that Babbitt's books are not strictly delimited, self-contained treatises on discrete topics. They all take up similar or closely related central issues that are illuminated differently as different materials are examined. In addressing its uh, special subject, Rousseau and Romanticism reflects most of the main themes of Babbitt's thought, making it representative of his work as a whole. Because of Babbitt's extensive analysis and criticism of Rousseau and other books, as well as in this one, unfriendly commentators have alleged that, for Babbitt, Rousseau is the source of the problems of modern Western society. Babbitt does regard Rousseau as a writer of genius and of seminal influence, but he also makes clear that Rousseau is but one of the leading exponents of a large and powerful historical movement that far transcends the work of, a particular, of particular individuals. Rousseau is of special interest to Babbitt as the a paradigmic cultural type, as the quintessential embodiment of an ethical aesthetic dynamic that is replacing the classical and the Christian moral and artistic ethos in the Western world. Rousseau gives brilliant and enticing expression to what Babbitt summarizes in terms of sentimental humanitarianism. To examine Rousseau's work in depth is to get to the heart of the outlook that is transforming Western society and to understand better the ramifications and impl implications of this new view of life. Babbitt treats the ideas of Francis Bacon in a similar fashion, letting Bacon represent what Babbitt considers the second of the two most powerful strains within modernity, scientific naturalism. So Bab uh, Bacon is the, the embodiment of, the, of a separate strain, the, the second of the most powerful strains, scientific naturalism. In Babbitt's view, scientific naturalism is superficial appearances to the contrary. To Babbitt's view, in Babbitt's view, scientific naturalism is, uh, superficial appearances to the contrary, intimately connected with sentimental humanitarianism in the philosophy and the psychology of Western man. Rousseau and Romanticism interprets Rousseau's ideas and relates them to literary works and currents that are either inspired by Rousseau or expressive of a similar or related sensibility. Babbitt does not claim to deal comprehensively with Rousseau or to present a quote, rounded estimate, unquote, of his writing. Neither does he claim to assess romanticism as a whole. He writes primarily about features that he deems problematic and destructive of civilized life. Of the scholars and literary figures who reacted against Babbitt's criticism of romanticism, some appeared to take personal offense. <laughs> they were themselves strongly drawn to the kind of imagination that Babbitt rejected as sham vision, Others may have protested less against Babbitt's comments about objectionable features of Romanticism than against uh, a perceived one-sidedness in his treatment of this large and many-faceted movement. The, absent, the absence from Babbitt's work of any systematic examination of more defensible or admirable aspects of Romanticism gives the impression that he is more indiscriminately anti-Romantic than in fact he really is. Though less than fully aware of it himself, Babbitt's own understanding of the higher form of imagination actually owes considerably to romantic aesthetics. One, many, one of the many examples of this fact is Babbitt's admiration for Coleridge's explication of the idea of creative imagination, an idea whose sources in German romantic or pre-romantic philosophy Babbitt simultaneously and mistakenly discounts. Babbitt, Babbitt does not retain, uh, excuse me, Babbitt does retain elements of the classical view that great art is representative in the sense of conveying the moral essence of human life, but he constitutes that notion, insisting that genuine artist, genuinely artistic imagination is free and creative and not just mimetic. 
Babbitt's criticize, uh, Babbitt criticizes the formal rigidities of neoclastic, neoclassist aesthetics. He opposes intellectual intrusions into art and condemns didacticism. Didacticism. <laughs> Romanticism has also influenced his theory of knowledge in that he regards imagination rather than reason or sense as forming the base of human consciousness. Rom 